excited to have you. I'm Donna Ackerman. I'm one of the pastors here at the Vineyard Longmont. Welcome on Daylight Savings, where we all got better sleep, and I can tell. You guys are like much more awake and much happier. It's an early arriving crowd, too. Yeah, early arriving. So thank you for coming. Um, We are going to sing a few songs, and then we're going to have a message on Isaiah. And um, we are going to start the the set off with a song that you guys, we're hoping that you know this song. Um, It's a great song. It's the beginning. It's an old Gosh, when was it done? Do you know, Matthew? Uh, late 90s. Yeah. Late okay. 90s, early 2000s. It's yeah. a Mad Redmond song. Yeah, it's a Mad Redmond song. So, um, But we want to come before the Lord and ask him to join us. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you for who you are, Lord God. We just want to love you, Lord. We want to love, have you help us love one another. Lord, we just um, want to sense your presence, your presence in the in the room. We just lay down everything, and we can we say you can have your way today in our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody said, "Amen." Amen. All right, and uh, Tim and Matthew are joining me as well as Ellen back here. So, give them a shout out. Sun shining down on me, and the world's all as it should be. Blessed so be your name. Blessed be your name. The road marked with suffering, there's pain in the offering. Blessed so be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to rain. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed, blessed be your name, of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Give and take away. Give and 
Exiled by sin, separated by my transgression. Now welcome me, your calling. Run into your arms. 
Good morning. You may have a seat. So here at the Longmont Vineyard, we take communion on the first Sunday of each month. So please get your little communion element ready. There's this little film on the top that you need to pull back for your um, communion bread. And then underneath it is the one for the juice. And I would go ahead and get it started. Does anybody want, need one? Do we all have one? Okay. Thank you. So when you're ready, we're going to get quiet here for a minute. I want everybody to please close their eyes. I have a little story to tell you. So there was this big room that a lot of people, some men and women, were having Passover and were having a party. And they were enjoying each other. And our Lord Jesus was sitting there amongst them and surrounded by the people that loved him dearly, that he felt like they would never betray him because they loved him. But he knew different. And then all of a sudden he looks up and he sees you standing at the door. And he says, please come in. Please come in. You are part of my beloved. So please come in and sit and eat with us. And after a while, he took up a, a piece of bread. And he showed to each and every one this bread. And he took up a cup. And he showed this cup to each and every one. And then all of a sudden, the world stopped. And he said, with this, with this bread, my body will be broken for you, my beloved. So let's take the body together. And as they were eating the bread, he took the cup. And he said, this cup represents my blood, which even though you don't understand right now, this cup is going to be shed for each and every one of you in this room and for others beyond. So please take this cup together. And then all of a sudden, the world just started back up like nothing had happened. Let us pray. Father God, I just want to lift your name up. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to look to you for our salvation, for the repentance of our sins, for the things that only you know that are going on in our lives, Lord. We pray that you would bring that healing that forgiveness to us. Help us to walk with you today and every day, Lord. We can't do it without you. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Say that again. Wait for the King of Heaven. He is 
So we're going to sing this in Spanish a little bit. Santo, Santo. ¿Quién fue? ¿Quién es? Santo, Santo. ¿Y qué vendrá? Vendrá Santo. El rey que es. Oh, we don't have a hat. Louis, sorry. So just say, Santo, Santo. Santo, Santo. The one who is Santo, Santo. The one who comes, Santo, Santo. The one who's coming back again. It's coming back again. It's coming back again. It's coming back again. It's coming back again. here in the room with us, so we don't even have to wait, but we know that when he comes back, he'll come back in, in his glory. So we just sing Santo, 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 one who's Do you realize around the throne of God there's going to be many languages? Many, many, many languages. And uh, just rejoice in the King of Kings who is everything, who was and who is to come. Just let's just give a shout out to Jesus to say, Jesus! And so, Lord, we just say, Father God, we thank you. We're joyous in you. We love you. We ask Jesus that not only would we speak in tongues, but we would speak other languages as well, Lord God. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. In the nombre de Jesus. Amen. Between my family and my career, there's not much time to spare. When people would talk about giving to others, I used to think, are you kidding me? I can't even afford a car. I've been planning for retirement since I was a teenager. But I don't want my giving to stop once I retire. In fact, I hope to give more. One day reminded me that slowing down and blessing others is so much more important than some of the things I've labeled as urgent in my life. One day's wage might seem like a lot, but over a year, it's less than two minutes a day. I couldn't deny it anymore. I could afford to give two minutes for someone in need. I want to create a family legacy that continues long after I'm gone. I'm so grateful that my one day can make such a big difference in the lives of others. Now, Miss Melissa, who's back there hugging people, she is our children's teacher today. So, all the kids can be dismissed, all right? Any kiddos that are going to class, please go now. That's you, Jaden. That's you. All righty. My name is Ruth. Welcome to the Longmont Vineyard. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being family. Thank you for enjoying each other as much as you do. And I hope that you stay as enthusiastic to listen to the message today. <laughs> it's going to be good. It's going to be good because we've got the best pastors in the world, don't we, guys? Woo! Yeah. Well, all right. Amen. Hey, we got a lot going on at this church during the middle of the week, and you're welcome to please come and be a part of it. Please look at your bulletin because there's lots of information on there. Uh, we're continuing our Wednesday nights, which has been powerful. 
I know I say that a lot, but you know what? God's Holy Spirit is really moving here, is really moving. So please come, okay? And then we also have, let's see, I know I saw it here somewhere. Um, we will be participating in our one-day offering on Sunday, November 24th. Um, that's the one day that we partner with Convoy, Convoy of Hope Mission to feed the children around the world. You'll get more information about that as time goes on. But start praying about that, like what kind of an offering that you would um, give above and beyond your tithe. This is a, this is a, spirit, a special offering. And believe me, God blesses all of our offerings and all of our sacrifices. So I don't really think that there's a lot more going on. We do have Wednesday night, which I mentioned, and there are other things going on during the week. So please look at your bulletins, okay? Thank you. I am fine. Um, I'm actually, I'm kind of enjoying that it's getting cold outside, even during yeah. the day. It's not like, you know, 70s during the day, and then suddenly, as soon as the sun goes down, it drops. It's actually, I'm expecting some kind of snowy sleep any day now. So. Well, the, the colors are beautiful. The, and the colors are awesome, and they're starting to run out. Uh, there's starting to be more leaves on the ground than on the trees, which is kind of sad. Uh, thank you for doing Isaiah. You picked um, uh, one of the servant songs. Uh, Isaiah mm -hmm. has four of them. You picked the most popular one about uh, this Messiah figure suffering. And so we'll get into that uh, in a moment, and I appreciate you doing it. Isaiah is depicting the suffering servant and um, who we are to emulate. Mm -hmm. And I think we can only emulate Christ if we fully have the uh, fear of the Lord, the trust of the mm -hmm. Lord under our belt, because um, it's going to hurt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, Christ bore uh, unimaginable pain and mm -hmm. suffering, and, um, and we are to follow Christ. But first, I want to ask you the same questions that we're asking uh, the, the, I would say the person on the street, but you and I both know it's the person at Aunt, Aunt Alice's restaurant. <laughs> First question is, is, is there any point to our sufferings? And can you talk about that? Maybe not just, you know, philosophically, but even has there been a point, has there been a point to some of the sufferings that, you, that you've gone through? Wow. Um, you know, we, I think we all go through, and I have gone through both, um, emotional suffering and and physical suffering um, and you ask if, if there is a point to it and um, I think one is to call out to the God of the universe mm -hmm. and um, and uh, just just say Lord I'm I'm undone here hey Vineyard I am at Aunt Alice's uh, I know you're also shocked Talking about some pretty serious stuff with people today, um, does suffering serve any kind of purpose? Is there any meaning to it? And then more personally, has anything good come out of your own suffering? What's your name? Jenny Walker. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for helping me. I'm Alex. Sure. So, uh, suffering, does it ever serve any purpose or is suffering pointless? Suffering what? Any kind of suffering, like when people go through hardship. Is, it, oh. is there a purpose to it or is it just sort of... You uh, just live purpose. through it. You just live through it. Yeah. Say a lot of prayers. Okay. What's your name? My name's Brad Wolf. Brad, thanks for helping me. So, uh, is there what? Any purpose or benefit to when we go through hard times? Well, I think, I think uh, that it can lead us to seeking something higher with higher powers more than ourselves, and that. There is a higher power, Jesus Christ, who cares about us, loves us, and, you know, 
watches over us, guides us with these angels, his ministering angels. Hebrews 1.14, those ministering angels are for us. Hebrews 2.5 says that uh, the world to come is subject to the ministering angels. And, uh, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Romans chapter 8 is the spiritual. We're spirit and life and truth. And the the, the uh, spirit of truth is in the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, and there's a lot of people that are... Um, faced with a lot of health and economy and jobs and relationships and there's a lots and lots of turmoil on every in every facet of our lives yeah. and so you know it's all kind of for a reason I believe yeah. and it's to lead us to, to the understanding that there is someone who cares and loves us and who will never leave us mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been to heaven twice. I've huh. had two out-of-body experiences on the YouTube channel. There's a, huh. It's called the Near-Death Experiences, and it's about people like me who've been there, seen that, done that, and, and got to come back. And so I give witness and testimony of what I saw, what I did, what I heard. And wow. there's a lot of other people there on that channel that say the same thing, and so... Yeah, hard stuff you've gone through. Has have you ever gotten any benefit from it uh, personally? Usually we do. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to look at it and say, "Okay, Lord, thank you for the blessings, and let us know what we can do." Yeah, the face and skull got broke. Oh, and car accident um, or what happened? I have an accident on, with a grain auger uh, okay. on a farm. Farming at accident. A yeah. at an elevator. Oh. And. Um, so then that time I was coming 37 years old and I knew I was in 10 days I walked around heaven with Jesus oh wow that's a long and time that face and skull was broken stuff and basically I never felt any pain yeah it was it was surreal so Jesus it was the whole thing was a Jesus event <laughs> and um, but for 10 days and I walked around in heaven with him and then he he walked me down this long white, went into this long white hallway, and I woke up back in my hospital bed in Good Samaritan Hospital in Kearney, Nebraska. On a bigger picture, um, in that, I have come to the point where I feel like the pain really isn't the point. The point is not to try to run from the pain. The point is not to have so much therapy that you don't feel the pain anymore. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's actually possible, but um, mm. that it get, being out of pain is not necessarily the point. Um, that uh, basically we are in this for the long haul. We're in this for um, what the Lord wants to teach us. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point, we kind of, I think, have to give up and say, do what you will, Lord. Do you guys like our guest interviewee this week? <laughs> I, was, um, I was doing the interviews on, uh, on Tuesday. I think uh, Karen and I recorded on Monday or Tuesday. And I couldn't get anyone to talk to me. I had one lady talk to me, and then everyone's just like, no, no, no. And I, I, was, I wasn't in a great mood anyway, so I just decided, I'm not doing this. If we just have one interview, that's too bad. And, and then I came back Thursday, and uh, I just saw a guy getting in his truck, and I talked to that guy. I tell you what, if you talk to people, uh, you never know who you're going to run into. And <laughs> so this guy, uh, his name is Brad Wolf. And so you heard his story. Uh, we talked for probably 15 minutes after that. He... Um, you know, since he, he was healed uh, twice, uh, spent time with the Lord in heaven, uh, really into angels, which I found that people who've had uh, near-death or death experiences, uh, some of them I've heard are really into angels, which is interesting to me because I'm, I'm not particularly into angels, but uh, they are in the Bible. Um, and um, eventually uh, he talked about some of the people that God's healed through him, and his method is he'll, uh, someone will ask him for prayer, and he'll say, okay, and he's telling me, what you need to know, Alex, he says, you seem like a smart guy. Um, <laughs> what you need to know is that um, Jesus talks to us today. 
and um, and uh, <laughs> like surely not, you know. Um, and he says, what I do when I'm praying for somebody is I'll just I'll pray in tongues, and then I'll just like shut up and I'll clear my head. He says the first thing that comes into my head after I do that that's always a word from the Lord. So I'll do whatever that says. And so I, and I said, well I have a um, I have a friend who we've been praying uh, for healing for, uh, someone in our, our church with some uh, severe respiratory issues. And um, and I said, um, we should pray for, for her. So um, he um, he says, all right. And so he uh, he prays in tongues and um, is silent for a minute. I'm kind of waiting. And uh, he says, all right, the Lord just told me that you're to put your hand on her and say, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. And uh, he goes, don't question it, don't self-doubt, just do it. I'm kind of like, okay. I said, well, when I see her next, I, I will do that. And um, he says, um, hold out your hand. I'm like, okay. And so I'm holding out my, my hand. Yeah, I was. Um, and so he says, but don't touch my hand. And so um, so now he's he's praying that the anointing he got from his 10 days in heaven with Jesus is going to go on me. And so... <laughs> and, uh, and so... Um, and by the way, when we do like uh, when we do prayers for people, we do deliverance style prayers, uh, discerning of spirits. Pretty much, we do the same thing. We just wait on the Lord, and then uh, I think the gifts of the spirit tend to function where you just uh, just go in with the assumption that Jesus speaks to His people today, John John chapter ten, and then that what you're hearing might actually be from Him, and that you don't automatically say, well, that's just my vivid imagination, and I'm too busy, you know, trying to be famous or whatever. Um, and just like trust the Lord. And so I was not unfamiliar with his concept. Uh, he was just applying it to healing, right? And so he's, and, and um, we see healing sometimes in the church. And we have some of you guys, God's used to bring the gift of healing to people. But we don't see it a lot, like not as much as some of the other gifts of the Spirit. And wouldn't we like that? We've actually been praying for that for a lot. So um, he's got his hand right over mine, like about an inch apart and he's praying, and um, and of course, you know, as you would expect, there's a, a ton of heat and tingling going into my hand. So this hand, any moment now, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm sort of curious. I'm curious what will happen the next time I pray for somebody, you know. And, of course, uh, yeah, you think maybe, huh? Um, I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> I'm all, it says in Hebrews, uh, he, he quoted Hebrews 2.5. Uh, right before that, it talks about how back in the day, uh, the uh, reality of Jesus' Messiahship, His divinity, His message, was affirmed uh, through miracles done by Jesus, by signs and wonders, and now through spiritual gifts. That's what it says in Hebrews 2.4. And so we know that spiritual gifts, the purpose of spiritual gifts is simply uh, for God to give gifts to other people through us. Um, we don't have spiritual gifts. The gifts are for the recipients. They're not for the, the conduits. Um, it would be nice if we could get that through our heads. But, um, but the whole purpose of these things is to, uh, to uh, reveal the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Period. So if we have more spiritual gifts happening, then, then that will be pretty awesome. So um, interesting guy, though. Uh, uh, woke up in a, a hospital in Kearney, Nebraska, where, his, where he was. So that takes us into today's talk. And uh, today's subject is a rather awkward subject because it's about the Messiah. But it's not the Messiah that we've seen so far quite a bit in Isaiah, uh, a conquering Messiah. Um, a Messiah who, who awkwardly is a child and yet is the king of the entire universe. So uh, even that is a little bit feels a little bit uh, uh, juxtapositional, if, that, if that's a word. Um, we're going we're gonna to talk about the fourth of what people call of the servant songs in Isaiah. And what these are are uh, passages about the coming Messiah that uh, are counterintuitive. <laughs> nice, nice to see you. <laughs> you want to do it now or later on? Okay. I really wasn't hoping this would happen right now, but why don't you stand up? Um, I need... Uh, Somebody, Jenny, can you come up here too? Um, yeah, I didn't say you by name, but so Jenny, if you could put um, your hand right. Ooh, excuse me. Yeah, just because he said put my hand on your chest, but I'm not gonna put my hand on your chest. I'm gonna put it right here. Um, 
But I'm just going to be obedient um, to what this guy heard from the Lord. And uh, Alan, in the, in the name of Jesus, be healed. see how you're doing, okay? <laughs> Just report to us later, not right now in front of everybody. <laughs> I don't know if you felt that, but there was definitely a lot of, yeah, there was crazy. Um, so the, the nice thing is it doesn't have to be theatrical. It doesn't have to be dramatic. Um, if it happened, it happened. And if it did, we'll know. So <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Well, and I didn't mention you, I didn't mention you by name, but I did peek at your husband, and of course, most people who've been praying for you knew. But um, yeah, um, I I refuse to say anything else about it except what what the Lord told me to say, and that's that, if that's enough, it's enough. So. <laughs> Okay, um, so somehow I'm supposed to give the rest of this message. Um, actually, it's quite quite relevant. It's quite relevant. I'm going to give it to you. Um, <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, why on earth would Isaiah portray a, a, a weak leader? Uh, we like strong leaders. We don't want We don't want a weak Messiah. We want a strong Messiah. But we have four uh, very uh, explicit uh, expressions of a, um, and and uh, Alan, you stay even if you're coughing, stay right here. Seriously, don't worry about it. Good, yeah. Don't don't leave from coughing. If you don't like the sermon, you can leave. But don't don't don't, don't leave from don't leave from don't leave from coughing. Um, none of us like weak messiahs. We want a strong messiah because uh, because we're comfortable with strong things. But um, in some of the, uh, the previous servant songs, it talks about uh, c- clearly referring to this person that God is bringing, that he won't shout in the streets, that um, if he sees a broken uh, a, a, a reed in the gra- in, uh, coming out of the swamp that's bent, he won't break it off. If he sees a candle that's been burned out and there's just a little glow li- left, he's not going to snuff it out. We see later on that he's going to bring justice, but he's going to do it with words. Not the way a real king would do it, like by uh, co- killing their enemies. Um, we, su- we see someone who's suffering a lot. And, uh, and uh, throughout the history of God's people, uh, particularly the Jewish people, they had a hard time seeing this as being the Messiah figure, because, because the Messiah figure is a strong figure. He's a conquering hero. He's going to subdue Israel's enemies. He's not going to be weak. And so uh, the, it's not like this passage hasn't been wrestled with by rabbis, uh, by people in the past. Um, they, they just did not know what to do with it. And so, um, and the other thing is in these passages, and you'll see in a min- minute when we read this, that the passage at, at times 
seems to apply to a people and not just a, an individual. And um, Isaiah either w- was a poor writer and didn't know his pronouns, or else he continues to ascribe this person to the, to the Lord, to himself, and to God's people. And so, um, uh, and, and Isaiah was a, a brilliant writer, so he, he did it on purpose. And so, he, when Isaiah, in, in the servant songs, he continually is referring to a, a person who's coming, um, apparently a messianic person. At times he's referring to himself, same verbiage. And at times he's referring to the Lord. And at times he's referring to a group of people. And so this is not easy stuff to interpret. And traditionally, the Jewish people have interpreted the, the messianic uh, uh, passages in Isaiah having to do with themselves. And, 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 and have the Jewish people gone through a lot of suffering? Oh, yes, they have. And, and is, is that, is that uh, uh, de facto an inaccurate uh, interpretation of these passages? No, it is not. Uh, because we're to emulate. That's the weird thing. And Karen referenced it in the, in the uh, podcast is that... Um, we're always to emulate Jesus. And Jesus says these crazy things like, if you want to be mine, take up your cross and follow me. And it would be nice to think that the suffering of the Messiah was a one-time deal so that nobody else has to go through hardship. Wouldn't that be nice? And it's true, except for it's not yet. <laughs> and if, if, in fact, we emulate Christ, we follow Christ not only in His victory but through His suffering, and that there's a purpose, a, 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 a life-giving purpose for the world and for ourselves in suffering, then that, that really is a good representation of being followers of Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about a weak Messiah and how on earth that works. And so if you have a Bible, open it to Isaiah 52, starting at verse 13. And, uh, and I think it will be behind me if you didn't bring a Bible. And we're also going to talk about... Um, hey, Greg. I always, I always wonder on, on, on fall back who's going to be an hour early. <laughs> I only mess with I only mess with my friends publicly. All right, listen to listen to this uh, description of the servant figure in Isaiah. Listen to this description. Uh, see, my servant will act wisely. And by the way, oh, thank you. Um, I needed that. By the way, um, I counted in this passage, which begins at the end of 52 and goes through all of 53, I, I counted for, at least 44 rather overt references to Jesus. And, uh, it's, and as you listen to it, you'll catch a bunch of them. And it's, it's one of the most incredibly concise and specific prophecies about Jesus um, that you'll ever find. But it's a Jesus that we don't want because he's weak. All right, see, my servant will act wisely. He, he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Um, imagine writing about God's person being disfigured. You can't even tell if it's human, if it's human, uh, and uh, uh, marred. I mean, how do we make sense of that apart from what was going to happen about 700 years later? And keep in mind, we're talking seven centuries from the writing of this to the figure that we as believers in Jesus and, and, and the writers of the New Testament have come to ascribe this to. Uh, so, so he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were uh, not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. And I'm going to put a pause on that because I want to go to the king, the messianic, my favorite messianic king passage. Now, this is the passage of the Messiah from the second book of Psalms, second chapter of Psalms. And this, this is an incredible description, a messianic description of the coming king. Uh, written probably, up, we don't know who wrote this one. It's not ascribed to David, but it's certainly written about the kings of Israel and or Judah, uh, but it has a deeper meaning than that. And I want you to listen to this, and those who are into Handel's Messiah, you'll recognize some of the words of this. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings, and we, remember we just talked about the kings back in Isaiah 53, 
um, who, whose mouths have been shut by this marred uh, human, non-human looking figure. The kings uh, of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And the idea here is, is the, king, the kings of other nations who've been subdued by David or Solomon are saying, we're not going to be subdued by these guys anymore. We're going to throw off their shackles. Or we can personalize this and refer to all of us ourselves as kings or queens. And viewing the idea of, of a God of the universe as being oppressive and shackling our lives. Have you ever felt that way? Do you know people who feel that way? We're going to shake off these shackles of telling me what a human being is. Or telling me what's right and what's wrong. Or telling me what's clean and what's unclean. Or telling me that what I want, uh, if it's hurting other people, is, is, is a, uh, an abomination to the Lord. Here's God's response in Psalm 2. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Now, this is an interesting image of, of God the Father laughing at the kings of the world who are saying, let's throw off his shackles. He laughs and says the Lord scoffs at them. And he rebukes them in his anger and he, he terrifies them in his wrath saying, and here's what he says, look, I've installed my king on my on Zion, my holy mountain. So uh, the, the kings of the world are saying, we're going to rebel against, against this king. We're going to throw off our shackles. And God just starts laughing and saying, it doesn't, ma- it doesn't matter. Why? Because I've installed my king. I've installed him on Zion. Now, you're getting here. This is not the weak Messiah that we're talking about right now. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. The psalmist is saying that. And then he said to me, now this is interesting because we have the similar problem here as we've had in Isaiah. The psalmist is saying, I'm going to proclaim the Lord's decree, and suddenly he said to me. And so is the psalmist referring to himself, or is he referring to a figure that he's envisioning or seeing uh, in the Spirit? He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Who do you think he's talking about there? It's interesting because Jesus quotes this. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Celebrate his rule with trembling. And listen to this. This is, this is the psalmist's advice or the one who's being appointed as king, his advice to the kings of of the world. Uh, Kiss his son. Kiss his son. Or he'll be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Uh, Psalm 2 is quoted continuously throughout the New Testament as is Isaiah 52 and 53. So, uh, which is it? Is it the weak Messiah or is it the strong Messiah? Or is it somehow both? And if it's both, how exactly does that work? We want want to be the master. We do not want to be the servant. We want a strong gospel. We do not want a weak gospel. The gospel was fairly weak in the first couple centuries of the church until the ruler of the entire known world, Constantine, embraced uh, Christianity, which was pretty cool, except they began to execute people that had minor theological differences. Huh? Not cool. Especially if you're one of them. At the same time, uh, those who uh, missed... Uh, what their fellowships had been like before great basilicas were built and people started gathering in rows listening to the anointed pastor as opposed to sitting in more circular synagogue style uh, rooms uh, where they could hide and worship and not, uh, hopefully not get killed. They began to wander off to the desert to be alone with God. Fast forward about 900 years and we have the church in Europe who wants to be strong does not want a weak Messiah, and they've noticed that Islam has encroached on the Holy Land. And so we have to take back Jerusalem. We have to take it back because it's God. And so armies are put together. Uh, people, prisons are cleared. 
people promise eternal life if they'll fight and die for God. And they go and start killing Muslims. Because they don't like, nobody likes a weak Messiah. They even uh, are welcomed into uh, another Christian city, uh, Constantinople, named after the guy I mentioned earlier. But their version of Christianity is slightly different than, than, than ours. And so they decide while they're in Constantinople, let's go ahead and sack the city and kill a bunch of these heretic Christians. But that's okay, because we like a strong Messiah. A couple hundred years later, the British found out that there was a country loaded with wealth. And so they began trading with this country. The country was called India. And they managed to conquer this country. And in uh, 1757, uh, the first great British victory in India, it's estimated that uh, that area uh, had about 25% of the world's wealth, of, of the amount of trade, particularly in textiles, but other things as well. India was actually the richest country in the world, 25% of all of the economic um, of the world. But it was okay because the Brits, in addition to conquering them, were bringing their strong Messiah to India. 190 years later, when India became independent in 1947, they had about 2% of the world's wealth. Where do you think that wealth went? It went to the British Empire, which became the wealthiest empire in the world. I don't know if any of you like Coldplay, but um, there's a song called Viva La Vida, which, is a, uh, which I believe... I mean, songs are songs. You can interpret them the way you like. But I believe it's a, uh, it's a British Empire repentance song. We used to rule the world. Now we, now we sweep the streets that we used to own. Never an honest word, but that was when I ruled the world. Show that uh, painting. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is called um, American Progress. It's painted in 1872. There was a sense that, uh, uh, without question, the United States has been a special, special country for a long time. But there was a debate in the early days about what the role and, and how to best express our patriotism for this gift given to us called uh, the United States. I want to read you a quote uh, about Abraham Lincoln. This was uh, 30 years before this painting was painted. It says, Before and during the Civil War, both sides claimed that America's destiny was rightfully their own. Link Lincoln opposed anti-immigration nativism. Um, at that time, they were al already deciding um, who was in and who was out. And the imperialism of manifest destiny is both unjust and unreasonable. He objected to the Mexican War and believed each of these uh, disordered forms of patriotism threatened the inseparable moral and fraternal bonds of liberty and union that he sought to perpetuate through a patriotic love of country guided by wisdom and critical self-awareness. And so Lincoln uh, publicly in, in Congress uh, spoke up against the Mexican-American War, which was in the 1840s, about 20 years uh, before the Civil War. So Lincoln was a young senator at the time, and he, he felt it was unjust for us to conquer Mexico and take Texas and uh, roughly a third of Mexico, which is now the United States, he felt it was unjust to take it simply because we were the stronger nation and they were the weaker nation. And a lot of people agreed with him. Even General Grant, Ulysses Grant, who fought in the Mexican-American War, I didn't bring that quote, but later on said that was actually one of the most unjust things our country's ever done. And uh, Lincoln's eulogy to Henry Clay in June 6, 1852, provides the most cogent expression of his reflective patriotism. Henry Clay was a Southerner who uh, was, was, they were trying to solve the division of the Civil War uh, through compromise and not through war. And uh, they held it off for, for a couple decades, but eventually uh, war came. Now, this is a painting of, uh, it's called American Progress. And this is the idea that... Um, since, since we're God's favored nation, that um, it's not only a good idea to expand westward, even if the country of Mexico is in the way, but we're to expand westward and bring all this stuff. It's, you see all this cool stuff here? It's progress. And progress is pretty cool. 
We've got farmers. We've got trains. We've got telegraph wires. In 1872, this was new technology. This was pretty cool. We've got beautiful cities with harbors. Um, that looks like the Bay Bridge, but it's, yeah, I don't know when. I don't think it was built yet. Then. Anyone know when the? Hmm? Oh, the Brooklyn Bridge. That was up by 72. I think you're right. Anyway, and so, and you notice the left side of the painting is light and bright. And it's overcoming, yeah, sorry, my left, obviously, my left, you're right, uh, is overcoming the dark side of the painting. And, of course, who's on the dark side of the painting? The bears, these pesky Native Americans, and these buffalo. Let's get rid of the buffalo for crying out loud. They're just taking up good real estate. Listen to this quote. American Progress by John Gast, 1872, is an allegorical representation of the modernization of the New West. Columbia, which is that woman right there, a personification of the United States, is shown leading civilization westward with the American settlers. She is shown bringing light from east to west, stringing telegraph wire, holding a school book, uh, highlighting different stages of economic activity and evolving forms of transportation. On the left, indigenous Americans are displaced. Uh, from their ancestral homeland. And I tell you what, progress is cool. And we like a strong Messiah, don't we? As long as you're not a buffalo. <laughs> and so this is our history. Um, uh, everybody has a spotted history, right? This isn't about railing against uh, our, our country. I am so thankful for our country. I am so thankful that Tuesday, if you haven't already voted, we get to vote. You know? Thank God. Are you showing us your t-shirt, Odessa? That's cool. Mixing the cross from the flag. Let's hope so. Yeah, if it's God's country, um, and here's, here's the question of the day. Uh, it, it, to the degree this is God's country, and I think that depends on if we're following God, and, and, and I think any country is God's country if the people are God's. Um, are, are we going to um, are we going to have a strong Messiah or a weak Messiah, or somehow both? <laughs> and I think both is the right answer. But but the question is is how does how is that expressed? All right, let me read to you um, something. August 3rd of 1990, President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, declared the month of November as National American uh, Indian Heritage Month. So since 1990, uh, November is National Native American Heritage Month, also referred to as Native American Heritage Month. The bill read in part that the President has authorized and requested to call upon federal, state, and local governments, groups, and organizations, the people of the United States to observe such month with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. This landmark bill honoring America's tribal people represented a major step in the establishment of this celebration, which, which began in 1976 when a Cherokee Osage Indian named Jerry Elliott High Eagle authored Native American Awareness Week legislation, the first historical week of recognition of the nation for Native peoples. This led to 1986 with then-President Ronald Reagan uh, Ronald Reagan proclaiming November 23 through 30, 1986, as American Indian Week, and that's progressed to what's now called uh, Native American Heritage Month. And so we're honoring uh, folks who uh, who, uh, who perhaps we're a little thoughtless with um, before. Go to this picture of this next man. So this guy here, if you recognize him, don't say anything, because you'll totally steal my thunder if you do. This guy was born in 1918. First name is Granville. And uh, he's uh, Cherokee and um, Choctaw. And he's also white. Um, his great uh, grandparents were part of what was called the Trail of Tears. Anybody heard of that? So in uh, between 1830 and 1850, about 60,000 indigenous peoples uh, were forced to leave uh, primarily Georgia to make room 
we had to make room. We had to clear the land because we were going to cultivate it. And we didn't want to deal with, uh, with not being safe. And so roughly 60,000 people um, were uh, promised land in uh, something called the uh, Unorganized Territory. Later became Oklahoma. And so they, they walked the trail from Georgia to Oklahoma. That's currently Oklahoma. 60,000 people, about 15,000 of them, they estimate, died on the way. So one out of four of these folks uh, died on the way. And Granville's great-grandparents were some of those people. So he was born in 1918. Um, he had a stuttering problem. And he also, uh, as, a, as a teenager, contracted tuberculosis. And so he's a, a stuttering, uh, mixed-race um, young man born in Oklahoma, uh, the part that wasn't um, later on um, given to the Sooners. Not the football team, by the way. Um, and he was about to die. And uh, his parents took him to a healing meeting. And some uh, healing revivalist, this would have been about 1935, laid hands on Granville, and he was healed of his tuberculosis. And this young man um, felt the call at that time. He had received something. He wanted to give it away. And so he began to, um, uh, in, in a rather small and somewhat pitiful fashion, he began uh, to try to hold meetings for people who were sick in order to get uh, healed by Jesus. And lo and behold, um, some people started getting healed. There's one account of he's at, a, he's at a meeting and he's starting to get a crowd. And he's a pretty, he's, he's not stuttering anymore. And he's learned, how, he's learned how to manage a crowd. And at one point, uh, he sees a man in the front row with a, uh, with a mangled hand. And he sees this mangled hand, and he feels something happening in his hand. And he leaps off the stage, and he grabs that man's hand and says, In the name of Jesus, be healed. And the guy's hand straightens out. I don't remember. And... Um, this man eventually became, uh, his full name was uh, Granville Oral Roberts. Now, in 87, I was a new Christian, and I was just as disgusted as everybody else with Oral Roberts. I was. Because he said if he couldn't raise uh, $8 million uh, by uh, the, the beginning of 87, that the Lord would take him home. And so it was the big joke. It was the same time frame as Jimmy, Jim and Tammy Baker, um, uh, Jimmy Swaggart. Um, I was embarrassed about Oral Roberts, and I was really wanting people to know that, that I wasn't that kind of a Christian. But I, I remember I was at a, um, I think I was at a doctor's appointment, ironically, and uh, <laughs> not from my hand. Uh, I might have been at, uh, I was at somewhere where you're not supposed to take, take literature, and I saw a book. It was a uh, autobiography of Oral Roberts. And I was like, Ugh, whatever. I started reading. I'm like, oh, I'm actually enjoying this. I, I, I stole the book. What? I did. I really liked that book. And I think partly why I liked it is because of reading about his background. And uh, nobody was as effective as an evangelist to the Native Americans as Oral Roberts. Do you know why? Because he was one of their own. And he never uh, hid his Native American background. He talked about it openly. Check this out. Civil, civil rights movement. 60s, Martin Luther King Jr. Hi, highly controversial. Do you think we live in controversial times now? Let's, take, let's, let's uh, get in the transporter room and have Scotty beam us to the mid-1960s mid America. Very, very few evangelical Christians would support the civil rights movement. But one guy, who's, who in popularity and fame was second only to a guy named Billy Graham, because 1987 hadn't come yet, and he hadn't, uh, his, his prosperity gospel hadn't quite reached that full stage yet. Um, he stood with, uh, with Dr. King. Why? Because he understood what it was like to be an oppressed 
people group. And he believed that the gospel was for the broken. Now, having ranted about all that, let me finish reading Isaiah 53. So we're back at the first verse of chapter 53. Hmm? He did. Yeah, everybody was disappointed that Oral raised his money. Uh, a, dog, a dog track owner, uh, a sinner, uh, donated the last $1.3 million. And, and he got the money for whatever project he was working on. And, uh, and most people were pretty disappointed because they, they really wanted to see the Lord take it. It's true. Isaiah 53, 1, and we'll wrap up with this. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now it's talking about this figure. He grew up before him like a tender shoot. And like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Isn't that crazy? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. It's funny. Sometimes, um, you know, we get into uh, theological debates about if healing is guaranteed and if it's for now. And, we, uh, we, and I'm talking to myself now. We miss the point that healing is in the uh, crucifixion of Jesus. However that plays out. Where was I? What verse? There we go. Verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. He did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. Uh, for the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though uh, the people... Uh, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide spoils with the strong. Okay, we're starting to see the strong Messiah, right? Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All right, so how on earth do we have a weak Messiah and a strong Messiah at the same time? I think the answer to that question uh, is like a parable that Jesus told, like yeast put in a lump of dough, the kingdom of God. It doesn't look like much when it's put in. Nobody's forcing the dough to expand or else. This isn't Jerry Falwell and the moral majority saying we will overpower you. This is transformation from the inside out. And when you're actually strong, let's personalize this now. If you are confident in your strength and the solidity of being a child of God, a follower of Jesus, then you don't have to open your mouth all the time. And you don't have to win every battle. And you don't have to fix, suppress, uh, moderate, um, wring your hands. You don't have to do any of those things. Why? Because you are strong. Because the, the yeast of the kingdom is inside of you and is transforming you. And I believe that we follow Jesus in His suffering and we follow Him in His meekness. Like even Paul says something like, that Jesus told him when he complained about his thorn, he says, through your strength, through your weakness, I will be made strong. And so it's a bit of a paradox, 
that the one who oversees everything and will rule everything uh, is fairly invisible and seems to be losing right now. But the reality is, is if, if he's inside of you, he is not losing and you are not losing and he will win. And so we can relax and enjoy the peace of the Lord. Why don't you stand and we'll close in worship. Sorry, Lord Jesus, for any crimes and any violence against other peoples, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, that you are the the strength. You are the Savior of the world. And so we just come to you, Lord God. We say yes, Lord Jesus. We want you to be, um, we want you to have revival, Lord God, in our midst, Lord God. We want you to strengthen each and every person. I will bring praise. I 
Amen. <laughs> 